Right, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Sorry for that, we thought we weren't uh, live yet. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, this webinar. It's, it's, it's fantastic that so many people have registered who uh, are interested in shark conservation. I want to hear all about uh, the EU's opportunity to help them save the mako shark from extinction. Uh, my name is Jo Swape. I work for Humane Society International, which is uh, we're one of the organizers of this event, and I'll be your moderator for today. Um, before we kick off, I'd just like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, firstly, given that over 200 people have signed up for this webinar, only the panelists will be able to use their cameras and unmute themselves. Otherwise, it will be complete chaos. Um, today's presentations will be few, just two of them and short. So we'll have more time for a lively and fruitful discussion. Let me also remind the panelists uh, to all turn their cameras off while others are making their presentations. Everybody can switch them back on when we move to the Q&A section. If you would like to ask the speakers of the panel uh, a question, please use the Q&A function, not the chat. Um, keep the question short. Don't forget to add your name and the organization or institution that you represent. And we've reserved at least 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer some of your questions. Um, we've got a packed program this afternoon. So without further ado, I am delighted to be able to introduce you to our MEP host for today, who is Francisco Guerrero, who is uh, not only uh, has he been active um, on a personal level, um, but it's been very involved in animal welfare, nature and ocean conservation, advocacy for plant-based diets, not only for health reasons, but for climate change and mitigation uh, for, for a long time. Um, he has been an MEP for Portugal, uh, for the Greens since uh, 2019, and he's the vice chair of the Agriculture uh, Committee, a member of the Fisheries and the Animal Transport and the Budget Committees. Um, Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joe, uh, and thank, thank you all for attending the event. Um, as a Portuguese, I'm fully aware of the meaning of fisheries for my country's economy. But fishing is always a tricky topic, uh, as, of course, the interests of the fisheries to make a living and to supply citizens with affordable fish must be always balanced against the impacts we see from the fishing industry uh, in our oceans, the overfishing, the increasing numbers of threatened and endangered marine species, and specifically the negative impacts of our industry fishing on shark populations. And I believe um, we were uh, all shocked by the recent paper that was published in Nature, highlighting that half of all oceanic species are already categorized as endangered or critically endangered today, and that their abundance has declined by more than 70% over the last 50 years. This is really critical. Uh, so there's a really urgent action that is needed. Um, but what is specifically concerning to me, and this is why we are here uh, talking and that we organize this webinar, is that there is a very specific crisis right in front of our doorstep, happening right here in Atlantic, and that we all have the information telling us that the short fin macro shark is at the brink of collapse. And if we don't act swiftly, they will become extinct. Um, and uh, I'm talking about the top predator in the Atlantic, and yet we have not been act actively uh, acting uh, in the last four years, despite all the knowledge that we need to stop catching this shark. For me, it feels like we are watching this species collapse or even go extinct, and we are just waiting for it to happen, and this is unacceptable. Um, for example, Spain and my country, my home country, Portugal, we already uh, voluntarily ban the landing of macros in our arbors, but this is not enough. Uh, my colleague, João Correia from APES, the Portuguese Association for the Study and Conservation of Elas Mobranch, uh, who I believe is also here in the office today, recently informed me that despite this ban in Portugal that uh, came about in the January 2021, this year, the volume of landings has not decreased. Um, it only happened five months ago, of course, but this ban still continues to not uh, be practical uh, in, in daily life. So this is not an excuse for us not to uh, be more audacious in our policies. Um, so we clearly have a problem and it's very worrying. We need more action and supervision. Anyway, 
let's try to find out together what are the obstacles to the protection of Marco sharks and how we can jointly uh, start turning the tide. Uh, thank you very much for these uh, opening remarks and I'm looking forward to hear, hearing all of your opinions and comments. Thank you so much, Francisco. Um, we will now present a short video from uh, Canada's uh, Minister of Fisheries, Bernadette Jordan. Um, this video was recorded for a recent NGO rally uh, for sharks, for Makos, hosted by the Shark League. Um, we wanted to also show this statement here as it's actually an ideal starting point to highlight the urgency that's needed to protect this endangered species. Uh, could one of my colleagues please share their screen and start the video? Thank you. We don't appear to have sound. Hello everyone, I'm Bernadette Jordan, the Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. I'm pleased to join you today from my home in Nova Scotia, or Mi'kma'ki, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this event along with many esteemed colleagues who are equally committed to the protection of mako sharks. In oceans around the world, these highly evolved apex predators are in serious peril. Unsustainable bycatch levels and harvests for illegal trade place extreme pressure on the populations. Maritime nations can and must adopt strong protection measures, and we need to commit to enforcing such measures to ensure the survival of the species. Canada continues to lead the way on this effort. Last year, we were the first country to act on the scientific advice of the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, or ICAT, which called for an immediate ban on the retention of North Atlantic shortfin mako sharks. In 2019, Canada co-sponsored a proposal at ICAT, along with Senegal, that follows the aforementioned science. This proposal was supported by 11 other countries, but due to lack of consensus among ICAT members, it was not adopted. In 2020, Canada tabled a similar proposal with the UK and Taiwan added to the co-proponents along with a number of other countries, including Senegal, that voiced their support. Unfortunately, this proposal was also not adopted. More needs to be done to stop the decimation of this iconic species and we need to be willing to take the steps to make it happen. Simply put, the health of mako sharks has a direct correlation to the health of marine ecosystems and by extension, the health of the people of the world. At the upcoming ICAT intersessional meeting in July, Canada will continue to advocate for the protection of mako sharks. We will be asking nations to honor the environmental commitments they made at the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species which includes following the best available science and banning the retention of these sharks. With the longest coastline in the world, Canada has a profound relationship with the ocean and the delicate web of marine life within it. Thank you to everyone in the Shark League for hosting the Mako Shark Rally and for your continued advocacy towards the survival of the Mako Shark. If we truly want to leave our children and our grandchildren, a future that includes healthy, sustainable oceans that are rich in biodiversity, then we must act together and with the utmost haste. Thank you. Thank you once again to the Shark uh, League for uh, sharing that video with us uh, from the Minister. Um, let us now move to the uh, next two uh, presentations. Um, the first is going to be from Dr. Rui Cuello. Uh, could you actually please start uh, sharing your screen now, Rui? Um, Rui. Um, he has a uh, PhD in fisheries biology and has been a research fisheries biologist at the Portuguese Institute for the Ocean and Atmosphere since 2010, where he's responsible for tunas, swordfish and shark stocks in the Atlantic and Indian Ocean, as well as, as, well as other bycatch species. Rui has been the vice chair of ICAT scientific body, the standing committee on research and statistics. Um, he is also one of the world's leading shark experts, um, a scientist to the core and the author of more than 90 peer-reviewed publications and 150 technical papers presented to the uh, RFMOs. Uh, Rui, please uh, go ahead, take the floor. Okay, thank you very much. I, I just started talking to myself as always. 
So first of all, thank you for the, the opportunity to be here and to present the, the, the current advice on short-chain Makeum. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, so as you said, my name is Rui Coelho and I work for IPMA, the Portuguese Institute for the Ocean and Atmosphere, and I'm currently the vice chair of the ICAT scientific body. Um, and this is not, um, what's going on? As always, it never works. Okay, so just a, a quick slide to some brief introduction. On, on stock assessments. Um, and as we know, the, the stock assessments that are conducted at the level of the RFMOs, the Regional Fisheries Management Organizations, such as, such as ICAT in the Atlantic, are the primary source of information for determining stock status of the pelagic species in this case. So a brief history on the, in the case of shortfin mako, uh, it's important to note that ICAT has started collecting catch and effort data on sharks for several decades. It actually started in the, in the mid 90s. Uh, the first short in make assessment were in 2008 and 12, uh, at the time using using simpler models, uh, then recognizing uh, that there was uh, you know problems at the time and then lack of information, we the ICAT started uh, started to fund a big research project on sharks in 2014, so that was recognizing the importance of pelagic sharks to ICAT, and it did allow an, a significant improvement in our knowledge about the biology, structure, and migration patterns. And with all that information and, and things were improved over time, a uh, new stock assessment was then carried out in 2017 uh, and the time using still those simpler models, but also some more complex models. So there was a, a big improvement by now integrating uh, both species and fisheries dynamics into the stock assessment. Uh, after this, the first ICAT regulations were put in place in 2017. And then we updated, uh, we did actually carried out new projections in, in 2019 using those more complex uh, integrated uh, models. So I have just a few slides to quickly summarize our current advice. Um, so the last, the, this last advice comes from the 2017 uh, assessment. Uh, we provide various uh, pieces of information to, to the managers. Uh, one of them is an important one is what we call the stock status. So what, what is the status of the, of the species at the time of the stock assessment? We provide this plot, which is called the COBE plot. And basically it has two axes uh, with two indicators. So um, if you have the first one on the horizontal line, which is biomass compared to biomass at MSY, at maximum sustainable yield, and then on the vertical, you have fishing mortality compared to fishing mortality at MSY. So, and then it's color coded. So it's, it's very simple to interpret. So if, if the species stock is in the green, then it means that it's okay for the both indicators. If it's in the red, it means it's not okay for both. And then if it's in yellow, it means it's okay in one, but not okay in the other. So this gives us the, the, the status at the time um, and and this is the plot you have here in screen is the the one for the for the north atlantic stock and, and then you have uh, this pie chart indicating where the probabilities lie within those those quadrants so basically at the time we uh, determined that 90 percent there was a 90 percent probability of the stock being in this red quadrant so it means that it was overfished so biomass was already below biomass at msy and overfishing was taking place. So there was, it was higher than uh, fishing mortality at MSY. So that's the status for the North. We did the same for the South. Um, the, 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 for the South, the, we only use those simpler uh, models, not, not the comp more complex ones. So it's, it's, there's still less data for the South Atlantic. So it's still not possible to carry out those, those more complex stock assessments, but using the simpler models, uh, we we showed uh, the stock status was not was not so bad as for the north. So basically, there was it was within the quadrant. It's more more or less divided. So around forty percent probability of being the green, around thirty in the red, and then thirty something in, in the yellow. Um, but the results for the south were were much more uncertain compared to to the north. Okay, so going back to the North Atlantic. Um, using those more complex models then. Uh, so the previous plots are the status at the time, and then we do projections for the future. Um, this is this is the, the projections in terms of biomass for various catches. So basically we simulate catches from zero in this case until 1,100 1, tons per year. And then we project into the future what, what will that uh, biomass, what, where it will go. And in this case, we projected until 2070. 
in order to incorporate uh, two generation periods for, for the macro. So basically in this plot, the, the lines that fall in this gray area uh, are projected. So this is what we would expect to happen in the future if those sketches are kept constant uh, over time. And with all that information, we then provide, provide to the managers what we call the COBE um, risk matrix. So basically, this shows uh, over time. So that's the first line, the years, in this case, by five, every five years for the various catch scenarios. So from zero tens until 1,100 tens. And all these here in the middle are the probabilities of being in that green quadrant. So the probability is that biomass is higher and fishing mortality is lower. So basically being in the green. So, I mean, it's, it's simple to interpret for any given catch uh, you will tell the probability of getting to that green quadrant um, over time. So if you keep the, the, the catch constant. And our conclusions were um, that we, we know a zero uh, catch zero will allow the stock to re be rebuilt um, by 2045 with 53% probability, and then it will keep increasing. Attack of 500, including that discards, has only a 52% probability of rebuilding the stock in 2070. So of course, lower lower catches will achieve rebuilding in short, shorter time frames. Uh, with that uh, information, we do provide the final recommendation. And in this case, given that, uh, regardless of, I mean, even with a zero catch, it will continue to decline for for a number of years uh, because of mostly because of the biology and the time it needs to for the, you know, the juveniles. They, they only achieve maturity very late, it takes them a number of years, so it, it will take some, some time. Um, and based also on uncertainties, because we know they're, they're higher as we project further apart, further longer in the future, our final recommendation was a, a zero catch for short fin Mekum. For the South Atlantic, um, again, the, the, we also provide some advice. Um, so we, we didn't do these types of projections. Uh, it's, again, the stock status was more uncertain and with the models we were using, it was not possible. We only had the stock status. Um, at the time, it was not so bad, but uh, for that reason, we, we put what we call a freeze on catches or a cap on catches. Basically, we say the catches should not exceed the, what, what the, in this case, the minimum of over the last five years prior to the assessment, which corresponded to around 2,000 tons per year. Uh, basically, it's saying until we can provide a better, better information, it's better to make sure that catches do not increase compared to what, what was required, captured at, at the time. And that's pretty much it. I have one final slide, if I'm allowed a couple more minutes, just to talk a little bit about science um, as a fishery scientist. So it, it's important to note that most of the, the efforts that ICAT has put in terms of sharks have actually been allocated to share shark in Mako. So within that, that research project, which has been funded since 2014, we have been able to, to do a considerable amount of research uh, you know, things like stock structure using satellite tagging, population genetics, that's for example, this plot you have here is just some hypothesis in terms of the genetics. Uh, we've done aging and reproductive biology, that's the figures you have here, it's how you age the sharks and that's very important for those integrated models. Uh, we've done distribution, that's what you have here, a huge collaborative effort uh, of many, most of the countries in the Atlantic to provide rad data and we try to see the patterns and, and where they are and the size distribution and things like that. So all, all this effort and, and funds made available to us have really improved the understanding and dynamics of the species. It has allowed us to provide uh, more robust advice to the Commission. And of course, as a fishery scientist, I always end up saying, you know, it's of extreme importance that such a scientific work continue to be supported. Thank you very much for, for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Rui, and thank you so much also for, for, for being completely on time. Um, that was such a great overview of the scientific facts and the projections for the stocks in the Atlantic, and uh, really appreciated hearing about the background for this scientific advice, uh, which has been provided to the Commission. This, this actually helps us really understand um, why the recommended measures are so essential to ensure the long-term survival of the Mako shark and why we have no more time to lose. Um, for our next speaker, um, we are delighted to welcome Ali Hood. Uh, she is a UK-based marine conservation advocate 
with over 20 years of experience. Um, she's currently the Director of Conservation for the Shark Trust, uh, which is a partner of the Shark League for the Atlantic and Mediterranean. Um, Ali has long advocated for science-based conservation measures for sharks and rays, and particularly those caught in high sea fisheries. As an observer to ICAT, Ali has been closely involved with calling on ICAT parties, and in particular the European Union, to heed the science for mako sharks and to align their fisheries management and commitments under uh, CITES and CMS. Please go for it, Ali. Thank you. Can you see my slide, Joe? We can indeed. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I very much appreciate the invitation to contribute to this event today. The dangerous decline of Atlantic shortfin mako sees the Shark League and colleagues tackling one of the world's most pressing shark conservation crises. And while Rui has provided a valuable insight into the scientific advice, as this afternoon's audience is fairly diverse, I would like to take a moment to align our mutual understanding on the pressures facing mako sharks in the Atlantic. The timeline of concern and the actions, or in fact inactions, over the past four years since the crucial 2017 stock assessment. The stock assessment which ultimately drove home the precarious state of Atlantic makos, indicating in unambiguous terms the action that was, and concerningly still is, required in the North Atlantic a no retention policy with no exceptions. So why is this such an urgent problem? This is our mako shark. It's a long lived species maturing late with lengthy gestation and producing a limited number of pups. In 2019, the IUCN classified short fin mako as globally endangered, meaning they face a very high risk of extinction in the wild. In their favor, however, makos have a high discard survival rate. The shortfin mako is one of the world's most economically valuable sharks, sought globally for its meat, fins and sport. And for more than a decade, scientists have warned that its slow growth rates make it exceptionally vulnerable to overfishing. This global oceanic species is fished by many nations and taken in high seas fisheries managed by regional fisheries management organizations or the RFMOs. Yet no international catch limits have been agreed. The Atlantic high seas fisheries are managed under the purview of the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas or ICAT which is comprised currently of 52 parties including the EU and covers quite an immense um, sea area, as you can see illustrated on the map. And who is responsible for taking these mako? Well, this graph here is for the North Atlantic. It addresses 2010 through to 2019 on the outside of this ring. And it illustrates clearly here the, the EU, Morocco, the USA. The EU having taken up to 76% in certain years of the total landings. So the EU's major role in North Atlantic mako depletion brings responsibility to take the lead in reversing these declines. How long then have countries had to consider this advice? Well, ICAT scientists have warned, as Rui outlined, about MAKO's inherent vulnerability for over a decade. In 2008, they ranked shortfin MAKO among the world, among the sharks at greatest risk from overfishing in Atlantic longline fisheries. Similarly, in 2008, MAKO was listed on CMS Appendix 2. Then ICAT, since then, ICAT has prohibited retention of big eye threshers, oceanic white tips, most hammerheads, and silky sharks, as marked on the table on the right hand side of this slide. And ICAT took these actions based on significantly less information than is actually available for shortfin MAKO. As Rui mentioned, in 2017, ICAT scientists undertook a stock assessment for shortfin mako with sobering results. The advice was clear. If the Commission wishes to stop overfishing immediately and achieve rebuilding by 2040, with over a 50% probability, the most effective immediate measure is a complete prohibition on retention. The result at the ICAT annual meeting was the adoption of a measure that continued to permit retention of dead mako through a number of exceptions, doing nothing to incentivize the avoidance of this vulnerable species. In 2008, 
Unfortunately, ICAP failed to make time for MAKO's, with MAKO barely making the agenda of the annual meeting at all. But in 2019, ICAP scientists reconsidered the stock projections and the dire state of the North Atlantic MAKO was reinforced. This graphic here is an alternative of that um, table that Rui was discussing earlier. The graph illustrates the probability of recovery under different fishing pressures. The green line on the graph here is the line of zero mortality. Um, and um, this illustrates what would happen if no MAKO whatsoever died. The yellow line is the 70% probability line, which is accepted by a number of parties as the line that is appropriate, appropriate probability for sharks. You'll note that even under zero mortality, it would take nearly 45 years to have a 70% probability of recovery. Attack of 500 indicated here by the purple line, um, including dead discards as stipulated by scientists, has only a 52% probability of rebuilding the stock to the green quadrant in 2070. Important to note that current fishing pressure, levels of fishing pressure, do not even register on this graph. So what did the 2019 scientific advice illustrate? Well, there was a recognition that the 2017 recommendation was not effective and will not halt overfishing, let alone allow rebuilding. But the scientific advice remained intact. Adopt a non-retention policy for North Atlantic MAKOs without exception. Yet it is the clarity of this advice which has seemingly caused frustrations within certain sectors. As previously indicated, ICAT scientists have recommended retention bans for species of conservation concern for more than a decade. Parties, including the EU, readily heeded and implemented this advice for the previously mentioned species, big eye threshers, oceanic white tips, etc., all of which had less dire warnings. The North Atlantic Mako population is severely depleted, primarily because of the EU, as the largest lander, had failed to establish a Mako tax until this year when it is too late. The dire state calls for dire warnings and drastic cutbacks in fishing. As always, the scientists give their advice and parties get to decide how closely they will follow it. We commend the scientists for formulating and delivering clear, actionable advice, at least with respect to the North Atlantic retention ban and the South Atlantic TAC. So in 2019, CITES also featured on the agenda. And how does this listing factor in for MAKOs? Well, the ICAP projections were certainly an influencing factor in the decision that was taken at the CITES COP. And it should be noted that not only are all ICAP parties also parties to CITES, but that the EU themselves were co-sponsors of the proposal. And the implications of this will come up again shortly. At the ICAP 2019 annual meeting, Senegal and Canada led an initiative to establish a science-based short fin maker limits as advised by the scientists. Their proposal was co-sponsored by eight parties and supported at the annual meeting through floor statements from the likes of Norway, Guinea-Bissau, Uruguay, Japan, China and Taiwan. But this joint science-based maker proposal was opposed by the EU, the United States and Curacao. These parties pushing complex counter proposals that fell short of the scientific advice proposing hundreds of tons of MAKO to continue to be landed. The US Curacao proposal went as far, in fact, as permitting continued killing of MAKOs that made it to the boat alive under certain circumstances. So 2020 saw us working through virtual negotiations. Um, but again, despite this situation, despite the virtual circumstances, we sure saw strong levels of support uh, for the non-retention proposal with new champions in the form of the UK and Taiwan, adding their names as co-sponsors of the 2020 proposal. And yet again, the obstacles were the EU and US. And the chair closed the discussion citing irreconcilable divergence of views. 2020 also saw um, influence of CITES as I alluded to earlier. Um, there was a meeting of, well, several meetings of the scientific review group, the EU CITES scientific review group, which come December drew a negative opinion on MAKO in the North Atlantic. Um, this was based, this opinion was based very much on the ICAT science 
And as Rui mentioned, um, this was then implemented by Spain and Portugal for 2021 in the form of a prohibition on landings from the high seas and a prohibition on domestic waters for Spain. Um, this, subsequently to this, an EU tax was proposed um, and, then, and then adopted, which given the prior decision by SRG and the actions of Spain and Portugal, the two member states with the greatest MACO fishing interests in the EU, this leaves us somewhat um, dealing with what we see as a confusing and conflicting message. And a question can be asked in the context of Spain and Portugal's actions, what is now hindering the EU from taking that last step, from aligning itself with that growing ranks of countries who are supporting non-retention? And this now brings us up to 2021. This year marks four years since the first specific recommendations for North Atlantic retention ban in 2017. And so far this year, through the Rally for Makos held previous week, we saw strong statements of support in video messages and letters from the champions from Canada, from Senegal and the UK. And these video messages are being bolstered now by support from, from additional countries. We're seeing the NGO civil society, sectors of the public, aquariums, divers, all engaging in this call to see the EU stand by what it's done through CITES, through CMS, and, and support this position. So we're now looking at some key points. So the conservation benefits associated to prohibition. There's a lot of talk about conservation benefit, what's important to us, what we feel is key, is that fishermen have the incentive to avoid MAKOs in the first place. Implementation of a non-retention policy provides an easier, simpler measure with clear conservation benefits. Discarding. It's a problem, whether it's under a retention ban or attack. It's the same problem, but the good news for MAKO is that survival is high, with ICAT scientists reporting a discard survival rate of up to 77%. I believe that all stakeholders will agree that we need to do more about bycatch. And for North Atlantic MAKO's attack, which will also result in dead discards, simply isn't sufficient. We are well past the time when attack would generally have an impact uh, the impact required really to offer the best chance of population recovery and over the years the EU has championed non-retention measures for other sharks without raising concern over dead discards as illustrated in this table below here. We can see all those proposals that the EU was a champion for in fact pushing for six years for a prohibition on poor beagle. The role of industry in policy and bycatch reduction and there's an awful lot to talk about here Clearly, sectors of industry are opposed to the scientific advice for non-retention. People are generally not keen to cut their incomes in the short term, but we need to look at the longer term issues here. And industry are not the only stakeholder. Even though they are domina dominant in the ICAT arenas, obviously the Commission has a responsibility for setting regulations, but what is necessary might not always be embraced by all. And this is where incentives come in. Currently, you can keep the shark if it's dead. And given Makos are a valuable shark, the incentive is then for the sharks to be dead. There is an incentive to maximize mortality. If Mako are protected as scientists advise, then the incentive is to avoid the sharks. We need to flip the incentive. And what are the obligations under the CFP? So this is about management for sustainability over the long term. Precautionary approach founded on science. And again, it's too late for attack. When scientists talk about attack, they include discards. When the EU says attack, it doesn't include discards, but it reflects landing. So the actual mortality is higher. This is confusing, it's misleading. And if the actual level of mortality is higher, then we cannot be claiming that the attack will end overfishing or represent sustainability. And furthermore, with COVID, we're facing unprecedented circumstances. Everyone has had trouble. And up until the CITES SRG decision in December, MAKO fishing was continuing. Overfishing continued through much of the pandemic and potentially, as we heard earlier, is still happening today. MAKOs didn't get a break from COVID, but there's a possible reprieve due to the CITES SRG decision implemented by Spain and Portugal. Virtual ICAT negotiations have proved challenging, but where ICAT is rolling over quotas for those species with management, this is not possible for MAKO. And where there were proposals for MAKO in 2020, 
the Canadian Send a Goal proposal was particularly popular and simple and represents a meaningful measure that ICAC could take during this current COVID constraints and make up for the delays since 2017. So in summary, North Atlantic short fin makos are in dangerous decline due to overfishing by multiple countries. Continued landings from the endangered populations run counter to scientific advice for a non-retention policy without exception. Create incentive for irresponsible fishing practices that cause stress and ensure mortality and further delay a multi-decadal recovery. North Atlantic short fin maker retention ban advised by scientists is based on scenarios that incorporates all sources of mortality, including dead discards. It's deemed the most effective way to ensure achieve the substantial reductions necessary and takes into account the species relatively high post-release survival. It is vital to remove incentives to counter and kill this valuable and threatened species. Ending the overfishing of sharks and rays requires sustained action by all relevant government agencies, conservationists and the public. And alignment and collaboration between governments, environmental and fisheries agencies is essential. The EU championed MAKO at CITES, and we now need the EU to stop hindering progress and to start championing the science in the North Atlantic. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge today's hosts, the organizers of the events, and our funders, the Shark Conservation Fund, and my Shark Need colleagues and their excellent perspectives and publications. And I just recommend an additional bit of reading here, Rhetoric versus Reality, Global Ocean, Movement and MAKO Sharks, available on the Shark League website. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> I was about to start chasing you up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I confess I'd be a bit longer, so there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you anyway for, for, for a great presentation. I think it complemented uh, Rui's uh, presentation very, very very well. Um, Right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm hoping that, that both presentations are also going to contribute to the long term conservation of mako sharks. Um, I now want to open the panel discussion. Um, uh, our two speakers are going to be joined by two other experts on the issue of fisheries and species conservation. Um, let me just invite all of the, the other speakers and panelists to put their uh, cameras back on. Uh, while uh, that's good, yeah. While uh, while I introduce them, so we can have more of a more of a discussion. Um, our first panelist is Anders Jessen. Uh, Anders has uh, had a total of twenty eight years uh, working experience in both the public and private sectors. For more than twenty years, he's worked for the European Commission, where he's now the deputy director and Head of Unit for Regional Fisheries Management Organizations at DG Mare. That, by the way, for those that aren't aware, when we talk about RFMOs, that's what it means. Um, he is primarily responsible for coordinating the EU's relations with RFMOs, and hence the sustainable management and conservation of marine biological resources in international waters. Anders is also joined by uh, Dr. Ralph Sontag, uh, who is a marine biologist based in Germany and representing pro-wildlife. Ralph has almost 30 years experience in marine conservation, including attending uh, key conferences in shark protection, such as uh, CITES, uh, CMS and IOTC. He also used to be a member of the shark specialist group. Um, maybe uh, both of you, starting with Anders, uh, would like to unmute yourselves and just give a very, very, very short introduction of a minute or so uh, to uh, cover anything that I didn't. Anders, please go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, so um, it's gonna be difficult after you know 20 minutes of listening to the others to respond because there was a lot of things in the presentation that I would like to react to. But first of all, let me say thank you to the organizers and, and uh, also Mr. Guerrero for, for, for participating and organizing this event and for inviting me. I, I, you would have thought if you were listening to the previous presentation that uh, the EU was actually not primarily interested in action and protecting short fin maker sharks. And I just recall that it, it was actually the EU in 2017 that was the first to propose protection for short fin maker shark and the existing measures that are in place would be based on an EU proposal, which was watered down to get it through, but that was not because of the EU. That was because that was the only way we'd get it adopted. So the first step 
taken by the EU, and we have subsequently at every point in the debate been the one who's been tabling proposals where there's a different view is which is the best way to protect them. We all agree current measures are inefficient and not up to the task that additional measures need to be taken. And that uh, just to put it on record, because you didn't hear that in the previous presentation, what is it the EU has been proposing? It has been proposing a ban on the retention of all live short pin maker shark, a possibility to retain, to retain a certain amount, limited amount of already dead fish consistent with the scientific advice. And I'm sure we will get into a debate on that, I hope. Uh, elimination of the many exceptions that were contained in the current measure and also mitigation measures, a whole range of them that are all aimed at driving mortality down because mortality is the key problem in this fishery and the only way to solve the problem is to reduce mortality. And for that, you need a whole string of measures to improve selectivity and also fishing patterns. Uh, they are all in the EU proposal where there's been a division and where it's been difficult to get a proposal adopted is on this insistence on a retention ban as the magic solution where uh, you would simply be returning the dead fish to the ocean, discarding them uh, with no conservation benefits. But all that I'm sure we'll get into a debate on, but, but just to put on record what it is we've actually been doing uh, rather than the impression that was left by the previous presentation as if we were opposed to any action and not actually uh, caring about the stock. So I'll reserve in the interest of time, but I do hope we get into both the aspects of science and also the problems with retention then. And as I'm sure we will do in the, in, in the discussion uh, shortly, let me just uh, ask a Ralph to say a few words. Uh, keep it short because we, we need as much time as possible for this discussion. Yes, thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks for introducing me. And first of all, I would like to say good morning, good evening, or whatever where you are. And I would like to thank you for participating here at this meeting. And uh, I'm very happy that I'm, I'm uh, invited for the panel. Well, my expectations, I am actually fascinated by sharks and I will never forget the first time I've actually encountered a mako in the Red Sea. It was only a baby mako, but it did make my day and it was a very, very special day, I think. But I'm also frustrated by the downward spiral and the disappearance of sharks and rays all over the oceans, all over the reefs, etc. And I really hope that with this discussion, we can slow down this uh, spiral and uh, help to save those animals. I think we need to act now. We need to have and work for a healthy and resilient ecosystem. And makos are an important part of this ecosystem. And I think we need to follow the scientific advice here. We should follow the retention ban and in order to save these fantastic animals. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Sarah, for keeping that short as well. Um, we've got, uh, well, we've got less time for discussion than, uh, than I'd hoped, um, but since this time will fly by, um, I'm going to ask uh, the panelists now to keep your answers short. Um, and if you'd like to respond to anything that anybody else has said, just wave at me to get my attention and I should hopefully be able to give you the floor when, uh, when uh, to, to respond to that. Um, to give the discussion a little bit of structure, I'm going to divide the questions into three main thematic blocks. The first, I'd like to resume the discussion on the conservation status of the MAKO. Then uh, I would like to move to discussion of recent developments under ICAT and CITES and what is to be expected at the ICAT's uh, intersessional meeting in July. And finally, and hopefully there'll be time for this, we'll look at the issue of the MAKO in the context of the bigger picture, namely the EU biodiversity strategy. Um, so let me start with perhaps a very provocative question. Um, the MAKO shark, it's doing fine, isn't it? Anders, let me start with you. Um, what is your view on the Mako shark situation in the North Atlantic? And do you see now more urgency for structure protection than the last ICAT negotiations in 2020 when the EU proposed a uh, attack, a total allowable catch? Yeah, I'm happy to respond. No, certainly the stock is not doing well. The science is clear. And which is why we have now for two years in a row been proposing you know, reinforced measures in ICAT for uh, protection of this stock. Um, we, in fact, and just to show you the 
urgency that we have felt is that we've been extremely disappointed with the outcomes. And in particular, when the core issue, whether we should have a retention ban or a variation of retention ban, retention for uh, no retention of, of live fish and possibility for certain retention of dead fish, that that has prevented us from making progress on a whole range of other issues that are equally important, such as how do we improve the selectivity of the fishery? How do we improve the, uh, you know, look at gear restrictions, et cetera, that can ensure that there are fewer interactions. In fact, in both 2018 and 2019, when it was clear in the discussions that we were unable to, to agree on a comprehensive measure, the EU proposed both years that we put in place a temporary improvement on the existing measures by adopting what I call the flanking measures uh, in a, a, a temporary solution while we let the big issue then revisit next year. And both years, the proponents of a retention ban have opposed you know, approving, I assume, because they feel that if the situation just gets more and more dire, there will be more pressure to do the one solution they support, which is the retention ban. So uh, I found that very disappointing because for two years, action has been delayed. Two years, we could have put in place improved measures already in 2018. If the proponents of a retention ban have said, okay, we don't like that as a temporary solution, but let's at least put in place temporary improvements and then we'll we'll refight the battle about the more permanent solution in, in the years to come. So two years in a row, we have been unable to put in place on improved measures, despite the EU's push for these. I think you're muted, Joe. Damn. <laughs> Uh, how, how would you respond to that? Sorry. Um, I mean, your own presentation was uh, was a wake up call for the for Mako's plight. Um, I mean, it's clear from the scientific evidence and as Anders has also indicated, you know, things aren't going well for the Mako. Um, but what else really sets us apart the situation from 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 the many other shark conservation crises around the globe and, and what makes international attention to this so, so, so vital? You know, why have these couple of years been missed, um, as Anders pointed out? Sorry, Joe, was that a question to myself? That was a question to you, I mean, yes. I mean, you came off mute. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, would actually, I would actually suggest that it's been way more than two years. Um, as I illustrated, you know, the, the alarm was raised for, for Mako back in the 2000s. This is not a new issue, and there has been many an opportunity during that time. We've seen the level of landings that um, attack could have been brought in, for example, by the EU or, or, or other countries to have actually halted the decline of Mako much earlier in the process. The issue now is that we have a species that is in a dire state. Its global IUCN uh, red list status has unfortunately gone to endangered. Um, we have clear advice and the simplest option here is to follow the route of non-retention. Um, I appreciate that that doesn't seem to be appealing to the EU, but it is appealing to a large number of ICAP parties. And so the, the counter position to the one uh, represented by Mr. Yesson is that, you know, the EU could move in that direction. They could reflect their position, align it with the CITES position that has since been um, promoted through SRG that Spain and Portugal are currently aligning with and take that position, um, change course and see the EU back in a champion role as it has been for previous shark species in previous years. Okay, thank you. Um, so then Ralph, um, just hearing what we've been been hearing, uh, people might say, I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive asking for an attention ban because you're thinking, yeah, anything we land, I mean, surely we should be able to sell. Um, so, you know, fishermen may argue, you know, we don't actually target the Mako, but, you know, why should we release a, a bycaught valuable fish or even throw back a dead Mako where we can sell it instead of wasting a valuable fish? H how would you respond to that kind of argument? Well, thanks, Joe, for this. But first, I would like to say one sentence to what Anders said. I mean, it's like uh, he was uh, saying that action has been delayed because the others have not been joining the EU position. I think it might have helped if the EU would have joined the position of the big majority of countries uh, calling for this retention ban. Then maybe there would have been more action in the last two years. But anyway, coming back to your question, I mean, we have heard now in the in both presentations that MAKOs are actually endangered. 
and it will take decades for them to recover. And so the objective must be to save as many and to kill as few makos as possible uh, in any fishery operation in order to shorten the recovery time for them. And we know also, we just learned from Ali's uh, presentation that makos have a chance of more than 70% to survive when they are released. So this number is speaking for itself, I think. <clears throat> and legally, they have to be actually released as uh, uh, if possible at all. But in my opinion, it also makes a lot of sense from a conservation point of view, at least, not to land animals which are already dead because it diminished the incentive of letting them die in some corner of the boat in order to sell them afterwards for big money. Okay. <clears throat> so, and it's anyway, it's very, very hard to control. And uh, <clears throat> in addition, if they have to be discarded, then there is no temptation to kill them. Because, and there's actually a, an incentive to reduce bycatch by developing new and uh, better uh, mitigation measures in order to, to avoid the work of releasing them. I mean, that's also a lot of work. And so it would be very important for the species and also for the fishermen to have as good mitigation measures, measures as possible. Thank you. Okay, Ralph, I could see, I could see Anders waving at me to, 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 <laughs> to come in there. I'm um, gonna ask you, keep it short because I've also got a question lined up for Rui and we have, uh, we have about half an hour for the whole discussion before we get to the Q&A. So please, yeah, it, it, it's, elevate yeah, I will be. I will be short. <laughs> two, two quick points uh, just to, react to Ali's point about uh, there was basis for reacting earlier. The first science stock assessment that was available upon which we acted was 2017. And I can't we react on the basis of the advice that's provided by SCRS. So 2017 is when the advice was available. EU reacted, proposed something in 2017. So uh, let's get the facts straight. Second, on uh, Ralph's point about killing as few as possible, this is where, the, in our view, the flaw is in, in, in the approach. Because how does returning dead fish to the oceans reduce the killing? That is the magic solution that somehow, because we tell the boats, now you just have to return them, uh, that they would improve their handling practices all by themselves, and then uh, there would be fewer dead fish returned to the ocean. That's where I would like to hear the, the explanation for why returning dead fish to the ocean, they won't reproduce because they're dead. What is the conservation benefit of reducing dead, uh, of adding dead fish to the oceans? Thank you. Okay. Ralph, could you give a very quick response yeah. to that? Because yes. then I want to move on to Ray. I think I did answer it before. I, it's all about the incentive of killing them on the boat or not. If landing them on, in the harbors brings money, they will kill them on the boat. On the boat. If it doesn't uh, bring money, if they are not allowed to, re, uh, to retain, if they are not allowed to land them, it will not bring money. So uh, the retention will, the, no, the retention ban will actually decrease the incentive to kill them. And that's, I think, a big advantage. Okay, thank you. Um, Rui, um, just moving to you, um, you mentioned in your presentation that the, the stock in the south is also experiencing overfishing and may suffer a similar fate to the northern one. Um, why are you proposing a, a TAC, a total allowable quota for this, this uh, stock, while, to, sorry, total allowable, uh, total allowable catch for the stock, while recommending a full retention ban for the North Atlantic? What, what, what's the difference um, between the two? So, so for the, I mean, it's it's different. I mean, the, the stock status in the south is not as bad. So, it, in, the, in that uh, that pie chart we show with the quadrants, it was more or less, you know, more or less the same around all of them. Uh, but there was a difference in the types of models. So, so for the south, we couldn't uh, yet then projections into the future, and with that, we cannot provide that risk matrix. So, project it into different TACs and then see what is the probability of getting to that green quadrant. Uh, over time, so so, and and also the, the southern southern stock advice is more uncertain. I mean, it, it's it's simpler models, the much less data. Um, it, it's more complex. So, so basically, in that scenario, the proposal is 
you know, to summarize, until we can provide better advice, it's better to make sure that the catches do not increase. So what we did was go, go to the previous years before the, the last data point in the stock assessment. You put the, the, the average in this case, I think it was the minimum catch over those, you know, few five, four or five years. I don't remember exactly. You see that minimum and then you say, until we can provide better advice, let's make sure that catches do not increase until, you know, so that, that was the main reason it's, it's a different situation. While in the North, we can actually run projections. So, we, so it's, it's what I showed. I mean, and, and there are different uh, catches, uh, TACs. Um, you, you can, you know, have an idea what will happen. So that's okay. the main difference. Thank you. Um, just just, just uh, following on from that, uh, Anders, um, <laughs> following what, what, what uh, Rui has just said, um, what's the EU's position? Um, what should happen to the stock in the South? Um, would you support the proposed uh, TAC? Um, I mean, I, I, as I understand things uh, from my, <laughs> my sharp colleagues, uh, that there wasn't any, any mention of it in the last proposal. No, I mean, the, as always in these meetings, you have to prioritize. And given the dire situation of the Northern stock, our focus and priority has been on trying to address the situation for the Northern stock. I mean, we have, when it comes to other shark species, we have previously tried to, to deal with both Northern stock and Southern stock. The dynamic, political dynamics are different. You're dealing with a lot more developing coastal states. It tends to make the conversations even more difficult than they already are. So we have decided, but that doesn't mean we, we're not interested in looking at it if there's something that can be done without too much of an effort. Uh, but I don't think it, you would expect the EU or should expect the EU to focus on this. Our focus is really on getting this, a solution put in place for the Northern stock. Okay, thank you. I, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Ali raising her hand. Um, keep it short so we can move on to the next subject, but yeah, uh, just please, uh, give your input. Just a, a very short response there. The Canadian Senegal proposal does address both the Northern and the Southern stock. It, it represents a scientific advice for 2001 tons in the South and saw broad support from uh, a large number of countries from both the Northern and Southern hemisphere. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to the second block of, of questions. They're more related to the recent developments at ICAT and also CITES. Um, for those that aren't aware of what CITES is, it's the uh, Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of uh, Fauna and Flora. Um, let me start with uh, Rui. Um, as the vice chair of ICAT's uh, scientific uh, group, and as an expert on sharks, you often present the MACO advice and also many uh, scientists from across the Atlantic are actually involved in making the assessment. Um, this scientific advice for attention ban without exceptions has, uh, we understand, been very clear and far reaching. Um, why, from a scientific perspective, is a, a total allowable catch not going to be effective to rebuild the stock until 2070? I know there's a little bit in your presentation, but uh, if you could maybe reiterate. So, well, so I mean, first, first of all, thanks for the for the introduction on that. I mean, yes, it's it's a huge cooperative effort, many years of many scientists, and and as I highlighted, even in that project, you know, it took it's it's, it's still ongoing, so it's it's seven years now. A huge cooperative effort and I think that's very very important to, to mention again uh, with regards to, to the advice so it's, it's not the, I mean so it's not 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 to take it if it works or if it doesn't work I mean what we have to, to realize is that in, in that table uh, that those catches those catch values that you model from zero to 1100 represent total mortalities so sh those should be the retention plus the dead discards so that that's one issue um, and, and, and here it, there's always, you know, you start to have some, some issues. So, so even in, in the, uh, no, um, a retention ban, you will still, still have some interactions. You would still have to discard. Part of them would be dead. Uh, part of them would be alive, but die afterwards. And that's here also, also where we, we enter with additional measures. So for example, we know that survivorship of discarded Mako is not, not so bad. I mean, there's much worse sharks, much worse species. So, for example, and then we have best practices. I mean, that those have been developed. So, you know, something simple like implementing best practices, how to handle uh, and how to best manipulate and discard those fish to maximize survivorship, is important, and, and that's something that, that could help. 
Um, so, so I think I mean it's it's that it's it's that the, in, in that table you have to take into consideration that it refers to to all the mortality, uh, which is complicated. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, I mean, I, I understand you've also done some some work on ecological risk assessments. I mean, maybe it's going to go into a little bit too much uh, depth here, mm -hmm. but if you could just very very briefly um, say, you know, tell us where the makers actually came out with such assessments. So the ecological risk assessments, um, the versions we carried out were PSAs, productivity susceptibility analysis, um, are analyses where it's 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 what I mean it's data limited approaches. So basically, we're not really doing stock assessments at that stage. It's mostly to rank the species uh, based on their productivity versus their susceptibility to the fisheries. And with those two components, we calculate um, a vulnerability um, you know rank. So the MACOs uh, came up high, uh, I think in the very last one, which was published in 2015, they were third. Um, and, and it's not unexpected. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the top four species were basically all lamniform sharks. Um, so big eye thresher, prairie eagle, mako, the two makos, long fin and short fin. And again, it's not ex unexpected. I mean, we, we know the, in terms of the encounterability, the, the overlap between the fisheries and the species, it's there um, in the Atlantic. And then in terms of the productivity, it's where those, those lamniform species have very low productivity, mostly because of their, their late matu uh, maturity and low fecundity, also because of their reproductive strategies. Um, so they come up high. I mean, all, all those, those lamniforms tend to come up high in, in those, where we rank them in, in those types of analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I see Ali waving, but we're moving on quite a bit in time. So I'm just gonna move to the, to the next question. Uh, to, to, to Anders. Um, just wanted to hear a little about your experience uh, in the past with ICAT. Um, what have actually been the, the biggest hurdles uh, for the uh, effective protect protection of the mako shark? And, and why do you think that ICAT has so far failed effectively to end the overfishing of this, this uh, species? I mean, you've said yourself the situation is, is dire. Um, well, could you tell us a little bit more about the European fisheries view and, and, and why the EU is so fiercely opposing the proposed retention ban, even though you've supported such bans for other shark species in the past? Yeah, I'm happy. I mean, I think, um, seen from the EU perspective, I think the, the, the problem we've been confronted with is that the core issue, are you going to have a full retention ban or are you going to have a retention ban for live fish and some degree of retention possibility for dead fish? Uh, and uh, there, uh, as I said, we, when I said it was inconsistent with the scientific advice, uh, when, when we proposed or explained his advice, there are in fact four scenarios in the management recommendations uh, in the, the scientific report from 2019. Uh, all, uh, there's the one with a zero tag, there's one with 700, one with 500, one with 300 or less. All of them are uh, restoring stock uh, to, or reducing fishing pressure below FSMY. So that would be consistent with our common fisheries policy. And uh, then the parameters where there's a variation and an important variation, which is part of the discussion is how long this, should the rebuilding take place? Well, should it be by 20? 45 or should it be by 2070 and what degree of probability. Now, if you go into uh, the negotiations saying that, okay, there are four different options and we are only willing to uh, look at option one, uh, we have from the initial position, the EU, we moved because we, and we have been indicating from the outset that the number is an, a, a, something we've been willing to, to discuss it's very difficult to reach a compromise if the other side said it's our way or nothing. And the problem is that that has prevented us from getting to all the complementary measures that are equally important if you want to drive mortality down. I mentioned some of them earlier, but uh, the, the idea that just returning dead fish uh, to the sea uh, would somehow magically solve the problem is, is, is I think, a, a mistake. And there are a lot of other steps and you will find them uh, in our proposal. In fact, there was quite a bit of interest in some of the other elements, but we had no time to discuss it because we got stuck on the first issue. And uh, I mean, to reach agreement in these bodies, you need to have some degree of, of flexibility from the two sides. And if one side says, you know, we are not willing to discuss anything but option one, 
then it's not surprising you may not reach a, a, a solution because that requires everybody else to move to your particular position. Yeah, I, I, I can see Ali kind of, you know, chomping at the bit now to, 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 to respond to that and maybe Ralph uh, uh, as well. Um, once again, keep it short. Yeah, I just wanted to put some perspective on, on these projections. So in 2019, the EU fleet landed in excess of 1,100 tonnes. 1,100 tonnes was the highest level of projections that SCRS undertook. And under that scenario, there was less than a 10% probability of stock recovery into the future horizon beyond 2070. Um, 1,100 tons of landings does not equate for the full, by, the full mortality. So we need to then consider how large the actual mortality on the stock is. Um, Mr. Yesen discusses the, the, the different options of mortality there. And as, as Rui has, um, emphasize those figures include dead discards. It's not landings, it's inclusive of dead discards. And that's where we have great concern. SCRS only identified one of those scenarios as the immediate measure which would do best for this species. And that's what we need to look at. We don't have the luxury of time now. We need to act immediately, decisively, and take this measure seriously. Thank you. Thank you. I like, <laughs> I'm just seeing in the chat appearing here, it says that this looks like a trial of Anders Jessen without a defense attorney in an undemocratic place. Um, I'm, I apologize if it's coming over that way. Um, but I think, you know, there are a lot of legitimate questions that are being asked uh, about, about uh, the reasons for EU decision making. So uh, Anders, I, I want to give you the opportunity just to quickly respond to what Ali said. Then I have a question for Ralph, which is more related to the CITES uh, process. So please, uh, um, please take your defense without your attorney. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to make up for having, you know, at least three, uh, you know, bombarding me at the same time. So I hope <laughs> you will take account of that a little bit in the timing. Uh, so one thing is, yes, discard, dead discards need to be accounted for. In the EU proposal, there was a mandate for the SCRS to estimate those, and that would allow us to adapt the tax. So, so it's not like the EU is putting its head in the sand and pretending that is not an issue, but we cannot make that you know, figure up out of the blue. We need scientific input. And there is a, a for those who really want to look, it's paragraph 18 of our proposal. So you can go look there. It's not an issue we are ignoring. It's an important issue and it needs to be addressed. Secondly, on those scenarios, and that was what the SCRS, the SCRS is an advisory body. It advises the fisheries managers. It is for the fisheries managers to look at time scale and probability. What is unprecedented in the advice that was given in 2019 was that the scientists decided to decide on the probability and on the time scale. That is not the way scientific advice is given. Scientific advice is to provide managers with options. So managers can, because any fisheries management involves trade-off and trade-off is policy considerations. And I think it's very important for scientists not to be seen as stepping in and trying to do the policy trade-offs uh, which are involved in deciding. So uh, that is, but as I said, you can read for yourself. There are three additional options in the advice that satisfy CFP and the ICAT convention objectives. They would stop overfishing within one year where there's a difference is how fast and how uh, higher probability, and I agree, we have even excluded one of them because we thought it was the time scale and probability, or rather the probability was too low. So we said that one we don't even want to consider, but it's for scientists to give us these options and we should consider them and then we, we you know, reject them. But it's not for scientists to step into the role of managers and say, we're going to give you one option and that's all you can, because you don't meet managers. We could uh, then stay at home and let the scientists decide everything. Hey, um, uh, Ralph, maybe as also as a as a uh, as a shark specialist. Yeah, I mean, and and hold on a second before you before you do, um, it would be good to hear your response to that. But also, what I wanted to ask you because we need to shift the discussion also into the CITES uh, realm um, about the, the promotion of the uh, listing of CITES, uh, sorry, the maker sharks at the uh, they've moved to Appendix Two um, in uh, 2019, and the EU played a very active role in getting them there. Um, could you tell us, um, as well as responding to what Anders has just said, 
um, what does the appendix to listing actually mean and what has actually happened in the EU since yeah. the EU listing took place? I'm happy to. Well, first the answer. I mean, for me, it's, I don't want to play a numbers game right now. For me, the point is makers are endangered and we need to re have them recovering as fast as possible so they can fulfill their ecological role, their important ecological role in the North Atlantic. And there's a clear scientific advice how this can be done. And that's the retention ban. And that's why I am in favor of the retention ban together with many other scientists, together with many uh, people from the civil society. And uh, I would hope the EU would join forces with us as they did earlier in the CITES uh, discussions. And with that, I come to CITES. <laughs> And uh, I think for this, I would need three, four minutes in order to explain uh, how CITES is actually working. And it's, uh, it's, it's true, in, in 2019, there was a global push to list MACOs on CITES. It was a really global push. 50 countries have joined forces to make that proposal. And many, many NGOs from all over the world were joining this alliance. And uh, <clears throat> so it was actually successfully, the MACOs were listed on Appendix 2 of CITES. What does this mean? It means that MACOs can only be traded or introduced from the high seas if that is taking place in accordance with the law and if it doesn't have a detrimental effect on the species. And this needs to be proven by the scientific authority of the state of the country who wants to trade or introduce them from the high seas. That's called a non-detrimental finding or just NDF. So ideally the pre preparation of a positive NDF would show where and how many specimens can be landed without a detrimental effect. Preparing an NDF would therefore be instrumental or very helpful at least to set a TAC in line with the EU CITES obligations. Well, the EU was spearheading the efforts to list uh, MACOs and before to list other sharks on CITES. They were very, very active on that. And I would like to applaud the EU for doing a great job here. It actually might have prevented some species from going at least functionally extinct. <clears throat> I'm talking here paw beagle in, in some areas and I'm talking here the oceanic white tip, for example. <clears throat> so it's, for me, it's even harder to understand what's happening now in the EU. To my knowledge, there is no valid NDF for 2021 for MACOs in the EU, no NDF. So no site is permission within the EU and within any of the member states. And uh, in addition, Spain actually issued a national retention ban voluntarily and Portugal uh, issued a retention ban at least for the international uh, uh, quotas they bring on land. And so I, I find it very hard to understand why the DG Mara has now developed and introduced a tech to be landed without uh, up-to-date NDF, especially considering also the scientific advice from the SCRC, who is against these uh, um, landings and who is in favor of a retention ban, and against the scientific review group of the EU, who is also denying an NDF for the introduction of MACOs into the community. So I think there's all the arguments against it, even in EU internal arguments, even ICAT internal arguments from the scientists, still the EU is keeping pushing that, uh, or DG Mara is pushing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We, 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 we're, uh, so we're, we're still we're running out of time. A sorry bit for here. being too long. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, no, but I, I think I think that's very clear. I'm going to skip a whole bunch of questions on on, on CITES. Um, I I have I have a question actually for Anders. Um, just a you know just a very practical question. Um, about you know the organisation of fisheries effectively because the the EU proposal I understand has has suggested that, that dead makos could be retained if there was an observer on board vessels. Um, the question is, and I'm asking this because many, many years ago, I was involved in the, the whole campaign on shark finning, uh, the, the removal, onboard removal of fins uh, on vessels. Um, could you actually tell us how many of the vessels or the, 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 the trips, the fishing trips they make, how many actually have an observer on board? And, and could you say a little bit about what protocol will be, be followed um, once the fleet had reached its allocation of, 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 of attack? Um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I do need to just react to one thing uh, Ralph said as well, because sure. uh, I cannot let that uh, stand, uh, because he said it's against the, what, what the advice is against, or the position that was taken with the unilateral catch limitation is against the advice of the SRG. That's factually incorrect. The SRG took, uh, issued its opinion before fisheries ministers had acted and indicated that they would review their advice if ministers took action. So the idea that uh, they have acted inconsistently and over, you know, ignored the advice of the SRG is, is, is factually incorrect. The, the SRG took uh, the decision because there was no action at ICAT, which was clear at that point. Uh, they knew fisheries ministers were looking at it, but they had not taken action and they uh, presumably will go back and revisit their opinion in light of the action. So just to make that actually factually clear. Uh, secondly, unobserver coverage. Uh, so what at the moment we have not the enhanced measures, even the ones that we had proposed as a temporary measure until we could agree on a more comprehensive plan. Uh, because what we have tried to address the concern, which I think is a legitimate concern that how do you ensure that when you have this distinction, whether they are dead or alive when they're brought alongside, can you rely on all vessels to honestly, uh, you know, treat and say, well, it, maybe it was not 100% dead, but we help it because we're very, very slow about releasing it, therefore it's a dead. I mean, uh, I think most fishermen uh, are honest people, but obviously there's always some who may, you know, bend the rules a bit, if I can put it like that. So we have put in place that if you are to retain any dead fish, you can only do it if you have an observer on board. So that's, that's the mechanism to ensure all the other vessels will have to release them whether they're dead or alive. Uh, so there's no difference in a sense from uh, a retention ban for those vessels. So for those vessels who wish to retain a certain amount, they are only allowed to do so under our proposal if they have an observer on board. Would, would it be worth considering uh, generating incentives for fishermen to not retain mako sharks? Yeah, if you have a, a brilliant idea for, I think nobody has, <laughs> has has come up with a, you know, a fantastic idea for that. I mean, for us, the only way you're going to bring the mortality down is to get them to avoid certain areas. For that, we need information which the sector has. Which periods are there particular concentrations that we need to avoid? What are the kinds of gears that could help, you know, make the survivability increase? And really importantly is how do we get the, the crew on board to do safe release both for themselves and for the sharks so we have more of them surviving? And uh, we're convinced that you, know, you need to give them incentive because if they have no incentive to handle the shark carefully because it's just a cost for them, they will release them as fast as possible. And that is rather going to drive the mortality levels up rather than, because as, as I think Ali pointed out, there is actually a reasonably good chance of survival of 77%. Uh, so, but we think we can get that number higher. If you have, have all vessels handling them uh, using best practices that are safe for crew, safe for the sharks, you can get that number up and that's going to drive mortality down and not just throwing them dead back into the ocean. Ali, I'll thank you. Ali, do you have a, a genius solution for an incentive? Oh, I'd love a genius solution. That would be fantastic. And I'm really um, pleased to hear and there's talk of a belief of Im improving that um, discard survival rate but I think we really need to reiterate that need to flip the incentive away from retention of dead makos towards avoidance and I believe there's no question that all parties stakeholders are keen to see effective um, bycatch mitigation but this needs to be seen as an addition to taking immediate steps we don't need to wait until we have the scientific recommendations we need to take steps for mako today and then add on those mitigation measures as we go through the process um, I think that's, that's a given. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. I just wanted to check with everybody that if we run over, um, if you're prepared to stay for another 10 minutes just to, to respond to questions and just checking with our host as well, Francisco, uh, since he also has some closing remarks, whether that's, that, that's okay with him as well. Um, just send me a, send me a message if that's uh, that's that's possible. Yeah, I, um, I have a meeting starting at at four thirty, so I, I will okay. have to cut off. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we will try and respond to stuff. I mean, ho ho hopefully you've had um, uh, been you know had the floor sufficiently also to give the commission's position because you know this this is a discussion. It's not an interrogation or a trial. 
so uh, hopefully, uh, um, yeah, that will be okay. I mean, I, I think it'd be interesting also just to move to the third topic really, really quickly. Um, and that's in the relationship with the biodiversity strategy, strategy, because we're seeing actually a lot of interests here um, that are at play. Um, the, the commission obviously has very grand ambitions when it comes to protecting biodiversity with under the European uh, Green Deal. And I guess, you know, the, the discussion of how to how to deal with the conservation of the maker may be a good example of where there may be tensions between between the ambitions and the reality and other kind of international commitments. Um, um, I, I mean, why? I mean, uh, one question, I guess, for 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 for, for Rui, um, you know, in in, in placing this in, in, in a context, um, when there's there's um yeah how would i put it um well okay why do you think this is attack, uh, attracting so much attention from conservationists um what why why do you think there is so much tension between uh politics and conservation you're asking me sorry yeah i'm asking you <laughs> i, I know you're the, the scientist but... <laughs> no I don't know. I mean, honestly, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I understand the issues. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, we we have the, you know advice that it's 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 it is what it is, and then there's you know economics, there's social impacts. I I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm honest, honestly not the best person to answer that. Sorry, but um, you know, it's it's. I, I understand the difficulty of the situation. To be honest, and it's not yeah. not easy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then then then, <laughs> then I'll pass the question on to to, to Anders. Um, you know, also because you're 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 with the commission. Um, you know, you you've painted quite a you know well everybody's painted quite a pessimistic scenario for for, for the Mako. It's in trouble in dire straits. Um, you know, and and if we keep on catching them as we are right now, um, how can you actually make the measures? And maybe Francisco will also like to come on this in, into this in a second. Um, how can we make the, those measures uh, for protecting the Mako? Uh, and you know, within the fisheries uh, industry as well, what what uh, rules they have to follow? How can we make that align with the the, the EU's bigger picture policy? Yeah, I, th I think you ha one has to be careful about not painting sort of a false dichotomy between what it is we're achieving, because I think despite the disagreement you may be hearing in in the debate. I think we all agree on the final goal. There's no disagreement. Shark fin macros are in need of urgent action. The disagreement is how quickly and what uh, are the different options that are on the table are the best. And, and, and that's, that's, that's where the debate is. It's not about whether this is something that is desirable or necessary to do. I think everybody around the table, and by the way, uh, I think somebody was previously, I uh, saw in some of the comments was requesting whether this is sort of you know, do we work with our colleagues in DG environment? I mean, the position that the EU has gone into in these meetings have been coordinated. We have the good fortune to have one and the same commissioner. So, uh, and, and we've worked very closely with our colleagues in DG environment. So again, there's no disagreement about the goals. The question which we have, I, I have to admit that we have not finally resolved is how do we get the different instruments, whether it's CITES or the fisheries instrument to work coherently together to ensure the best outcome for short and make or sharks? I mean, uh, you will not be surprised that on the fisheries side, I mean, the only ones that are equipped with instruments to affect mortality on the sea are the fisheries bodies uh, because CITES deals with trade. So this is after the fact. So CITES in itself is not enough. Uh, and and uh, obviously, if you have put measures in place for fisheries purposes, again, CITES can act as a reinforcing factor if they work in parallel and complementary. Uh, I mean, we're not, as, as our previous uh, speakers have pointed out, we have um, at the moment, because there was a decision to, or an opinion given by the SRG early December, fisheries ministers then took a decision later in December, the SRG, doesn't have, we haven't had an opinion 
from the SRG taking into account the latest state of, of development. So I, I don't see a, a dichotomy. I think it's all uh, in the pushing towards the same goals. What you're hearing is, uh, you know, some feel that a particular set of measures are more uh, desirable than others. And, and that's where the disagreement lies, not about whether there's a need to do something, whether there's an urgent need. Uh, that That's, that's I, I think, is a false dilemma. That is not where we are. Everybody agrees on that. And even... You know, in ICAT, everybody has agreed. But we've had this inability to bridge this, this, this final gap on the core measure that needs to be put in place. Okay. Um, can I just ask, um, is Francisco is back on camera? Do you have an additional ten minutes, um, Francisco? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay, okay, because then I'd, I'd like to make it 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. Yeah, just 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then you. I'm, I'm just going to ask uh, just two questions from, uh, from uh, that we've had come in through in the Q&A, because there have been quite a lot of them. And I'm going to use the opportunity to ask one of them, at least to Amber, since he's still here. Um, this comes from uh, Yaisa uh, Jonkers uh, from the IPNLF. Um, this is when, uh, when obtaining the approval on the EU mandate to negotiate MAKO measures at ICAT, has this mandate been coordinated slash aligned between DG Mare and DG Envy, or is this solely the responsibility of DG Mare? Uh, no, it has been coordinated uh, with uh, DG Environment. And, and also, obviously, as I said, we have the same commissioner. So it's also coordinated at that level, because of course you can imagine the, the same commissioner and his cabinet are, are going to look at both sides of the equation since he has, he has, he's double hatted and has two, two responsibilities. So, so that is a clear yes. I saw also, if I can just anticipate, because I will have to leave shortly, there was a yes. similar question related to member states. And I can just, uh, to, to the person who was asking were member states, this is part of the process in order to get a mandate for the annual meetings, we have to get approval from the council amended in the form of a non-paper that sets out the approach that we are pursuing uh, in the annual meetings. So, so just to confirm that, of course, it's also been coordinated with member states. Okay, well, that's great. That that also uh, covers one of my uh, my uh, question, other questions for you. Uh, let me see if I can paraphrase one from Ulrich uh, Kolowski from the Deutsche Stiftung Mierschutz. Um, um, it's, it's basically what will happen if the uh, the tack is exceeded by the mid of the, in the middle of the year. Um, you know how what will happen then? Will will you then ban further retention, or will you just see the end of the year how much Mako has actually been retained? Um, you know he points out that uh, that uh, you know in in 2019 alone Spain had uh, already landed 866 tons of Mako. Um, Probably paraphrasing that badly, but maybe you can give some input onto that before you unfortunately have to leave us. Yeah, no, I, I, I let me let me first say about the Spanish figure that I've now heard a couple of times mentioned. What that figure does actually not reflect is the significant effort that the sector has already done. I mean, even before we put measures in place, I think uh, they clearly have seen which way the wind was blowing. The EU, and that relates both to the Portuguese and the Spanish fleet, have reduced their catches by more than 40%. So when you hear a figure like that, you know, okay, where did where do we come from and where, where do we need to go? So there's already been 40% traveled. There's more to be done, clearly. And that's, that's uh, the, how do we get us down to the next level, which as a first step would be potentially 500. And then you have to factor in once we have advice on the uh, on dead dates cards. So, so that's, so what happens once you get, well, then you are in a situation you would be under retention ban because at that point they can't retain anymore. So they would have to return them to the sea. So in the sense, there's no difference because of that, from that point on, once you have hit the limit, the ceiling, well, then you're in a you know, discard obligation. You have to return the, the fish to the ocean as the advocates of the, uh, uh, a retention ban would in any event. So from that point on, there's no difference. The difference is up till you get to the ceiling, yes, there's an ability to retain dead fish if you have an observer on board, if you don't, you have to release them. So, uh, so I think there's no no difference. But I think that's an important just clarification there. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think then uh, you've probably escaped many of the other questions that have come in. Um, but I would like to very much thank you for your participation today. Not and on purpose, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> a bit, uh, sorry if it seemed like a bit of an in inquisition, but uh, it's, it's you know we great we greatly appreciate you having participated, and 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 answered the questions uh, that we have for you and gone in discussion with uh, the scientists and the conservationists here. I'm going to ask um, uh, one additional question now to to, to the panel. Something uh, else. Goodbye has then. Come in. <laughs> and I'll wave goodbye to you and thank, thank you, you again. Yeah, bye -bye. And then after that question, I'll hand over to Francisco for some uh, closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, question, final question uh, from for, for, for Rui and oh, it's sort of on this. Uh, from Valeska uh, Dimel. I'm not quite sure which uh, organization she represents, but it says um, the. Uh, uh, well, so the, the, the 2020 proposal requires that dead bicourt mako sharks can only be retained if there's an observer on board. Um, can you say anything about the, the, the coverage? Um, actually, we, we kind of covered a lot of this. Sorry, should I, should I move to a different question? Because I think Anne has also answered that one. Um, right, Ralph, um, can you tell us which member states actually pushed for? This is from Ian Campbell. Uh, push for the Mako site is listing uh, to encourage the Commission to abide by the advice of their very own CITES experts and ICAT scientists. Well, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the, the Mako proposal was uh, um, proposed by more than 50 countries from all over the world. And uh, it was from the Arab region, it was a lot of Africans, it was Latin Americans, it was all of the EU. And so it was like a global push, basically. And uh, maybe one more sentence about the SRG. I mean, uh, yes and left yet, yeah, but he said uh, the SRG opinion is uh, factual, not there or whatever he said. I mean, fact is SRG opinions are revisited regularly, but the current SRG opinion is clearly against an NDF. I think that's that's something I would like to <laughs> to add here, yeah. and uh, yeah, and the other point I would also like to add from uh, uh, from Anders' uh, uh, explanation before. I mean, he's then talking. Let's say we have from May on we have a retention ban, and until May we can kill 300 tons or 288 tons. And I think why make it so complicated? Why don't you do the retention ban right from the beginning? which is better for the population. And I think it's better for the fishermen as well because healthy shark populations are in the end good for the environment, good for the biodiversity <coughs> and therefore good for fishery. Yeah. Okay. So just to follow on from what Ralph was saying there, look, the advice is clear and the support yeah. across the Atlantic, both North and South is remarkable. The step here is simple and the time really is now. We need to see this happen yeah. ahead of this July meeting. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to just go one more uh, uh, question. This is from uh, Luis uh, from APECE, which I think is a fisheries organization. Um, he says, and I think it's important to also get you know the the, the practical experience of people that are on fishing boats here. And uh, uh, I'm going to I think throw this over maybe to Rui, maybe to others. He says, um, I've worked aboard commercial longliners, and I know firsthand how things really are. Most makos are caught alive. Fishermen are not monsters, but money talks. As long as retention of dead makos is allowed, all makos will be caught dead, he says. Um, this is similar to what's happening in Portugal with another half measure. Since the implementation of the ban on landings of makos caught in international waters, all makos are now being declared as being caught in national waters. Um, Rui, could you respond to that and Ali too? And then uh, also, because it's related to Portugal, then we can hand back over to Francisco. I mean, very quickly. I mean, yeah. The, 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 I mean, I can, can refer to the to the hooking mortality and to the post-release mortality, which in the case of makos is, is indeed uh, well, the mortality is low, so they have good survival. That that's true. I mean, we've done a number of studies on that. Um, so so there's where there are opportunities, and and that's also one of my earlier interventions about the importance to work with the sector on that to try to improve that uh, you know we, we have the best practice the, the best handling practices are, are we have books on that i mean that, that that's been done so now it's more a matter of actually implementing them and that need that, you know it, need, it will need some awareness actions it will need some you know some some strategies to 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 really implement them that's what i can comment in terms of that thank you <clears throat> yeah ali 
I think, again, this is about incentives. So the question that Luis just raised there is about incentives. We need to remove the incentive to retain by having a non-retention policy. Okay, Ralph? Same, same. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then if you're all in agreement, um, I'm gonna hand over to Francisco uh, to, uh, to, to give his uh, closing remarks and maybe also to comment on what's just been said. Okay, thank you, Joe, and thanks for, for everyone. Um, I'll be brief because it, we, we are one hour and a half with a very good discussion that I think uh, represents and shows the complexity uh, of the issue. But uh, I also organized this, this event to, to learn more, and obviously uh, I did so. It's, so thank you very much again for all the contributions and all the comments in the chat. Uh, even though some of them are not uh, in favor, but I think that enriches the, the dialogue. Uh, but I, in my perspective, the key message from our discussion is that the scientific advice is clear and surprisingly far-reaching. Far uh, and at MACOS uh, in the North Atl Atlantic needs uh, a full retention ban. And that's what, uh, that's what we should be uh, striving for and working for. And so uh, we are now hoping for the ICAT meeting in July that uh, must decide the best options uh, for the survival of MAKO. And this is urgent, so uh, very per uh, pertinent to our discussion today. And let's hope that also the EU institutions and member states will uh, fulfill their central responsibility on the matter. As a Portuguese and also European, uh, I will be uh, obviously fighting for, for the best outcome uh, and that has the scientific support behind it. So uh, once again, thank you very much for the debate and uh, let's continue working for the salvation of this very important species that is the Mako shark. Thank you very much once again. Many thanks, Francisco, and thank you so much for hosting this event. Uh, as always with these, these events, there's never enough time to, to, to have the discussion, but we know that having a two hour meeting would be far too long for everybody to, to stick with us. Um, so we're hoping that, uh, that uh, some of the questions, um, we're hoping a lot of them have already been answered, um, but, uh, but our colleagues, uh, some of our co-organizers will try to respond to, to, to some of the questions uh, offline uh, as, as much as they can. Um, I thank you all once again to our speakers, to Ali, to Rui, for Ralph, to, for, for, for joining us today. Thank you for your great presentations and contributions. Um, I'm going to close this meeting now and uh, thank you all again to the audience as well for, for sticking with us and following this discussion. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>